When the reality show Survivor first aired, my dad was a, an avid watcher of the show. He didn't care much, though, for the interpersonal relationship aspect of the show. In fact, he would often do something else, leave the room. If he'd recorded the show, he'd just fast forward through those bits. Now, now what he liked was seeing people taking on a challenge. And if you know anything about uh, Survivor, you know that the whole show is a challenge, but throughout the show, they have all these different challenges, often physical challenges, to kind of work through the elimination process. And my dad loved that. And I used to enjoy it too. I'd sit there and watch those bits with him as well. I think we like to watch people taking on a challenge. It's inspiring, uh, makes us think, can I do that? Uh, and so we watch reality shows like Survivor, or maybe it's The Amazing Race or SAS Australia if you're particularly sadistic. Most of us like to accept a good challenge ourselves as well. And so we, we participate in competitions like Tough Mudder, a 16 kilometer mud obstacle course, or maybe it's just Park Run, five kilometer running course on a Saturday morning. Or maybe you, your challenge is something different. You, you like mental challenges. You're someone who gets a real kick out of a, a puzzle or a crossword or something like that. And obviously there are life challenges too that we take on. You know, work, uh, a project, something like parenthood is, is a challenge that people go, yep, I'll, I'll take that on, I suppose. I think with all these things, one of the things that, that's key to them is that challenge is just built into the experience. Like it's almost part of the point of some of these things. It's supposed to be difficult and you go into it knowing that it's supposed to be difficult and that helps you as you go through it. And if you've ever taken on a challenge or watched other people take on significant challenges, you know that, that when, you, when they go through that challenge and they, they endure it and they come out the other end, there's a real payoff. There's a satisfaction of getting through it. And in many respects, the same is true of Christian ministry. In many respects. Particularly the fact that there is an inherent challenge to Christian ministry. It's difficult. And from the reading that Danny just brought to us, we see that in the beginning of 2 Timothy chapter 2. The Apostle Paul, he writes to what many have called his ministry apprentice, Timothy. He's writing from his own imprisonment to Timothy. And he writes about the challenge of ministry and about accepting that challenge wisely, not naively. That is, knowing that it's going to be difficult, not being thrown by that. And because ministry... There are particular shapes that ministry takes, formal shapes, but really, I shouldn't have to tell you, ministry is something that is part of every Christian believer's life. We all participate in ministry in one way or another. And because that's true, and because today, this, this Sunday, we're doing a formal commissioning of those involved in formal ministry for the year, this is an important reality to consider, the challenge of ministry. And in this passage, Paul paints a picture of what that challenge is like, how it can be faced or coped with, and whether it's worth it, what it's really like, how it can be faced, and whether it's worth it, whether there's any satisfaction, as it were, at the end. And he begins in verses 1 and 2 with a bit of a preamble into all this, reminding Timothy, his son, that's a lovely term, isn't it? My son, it's a real affectionate term. Uh, of his vitally important ministry that, that Timothy has, this responsibility he has to what? To pass on the gospel message faithfully. But not just to pass it on to other people, but to pass it on to other faithful people who will then be equipped to pass it on to other faithful people. I mean, just in that description, you've got four generations of the gospel being passed on and described there. And Paul urges Timothy to be strong in doing this. That's what we often do when we kind of charge someone with a responsibility. Be strong. But this is not be strong in himself, is it? It's strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What does that, what does that mean, be strong in the grace? Well, if you, if you listen to our Romans 12 to 14 series, that will hopefully help you understand a little bit what that means. It really just is a way of saying your motivation and your effectiveness and your ability and endurance to do this task, it will come from one source. It'll come from Jesus. It'll come from the grace you have in him. You're not doing this to earn approval with God. Jesus has done that by his perfect life and death and resurrection. You're not having to do that. Jesus has given you all you will need for life. Therefore, he will give you all you will need 
to minister for him, to do this faithfully. So we are strong in the grace. And this is, I think this has always been countercultural, but particularly in recent times for us, isn't it? I mean, a buzz idea that's been around for decades in our time is to find inner strength, right? To dig deeper within yourself. But Paul says to Timothy, no, don't dig deeper, lean harder. Don't dig deeper, lean harder. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So that's the starting point. Ministry is not about us. We might have a particular role, but it's not about us. Not in its content, not in its conduct. It's about Jesus. So why then does Timothy and all ministry workers need to be strong in Christ? Because ministry is a challenge. Because ministry is difficult. Because ministry involves suffering. And Paul describes the nature of this suffering in verse 3. It's as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. A good soldier. This is not the only place in the Bible where spiritual work is characterised in soldiering military combat terms. And of course, that's appropriate. There is the reality of spiritual warfare that all Christian believers are a part of, whether you want to be or not. (laughs) Between God's good ways and his holiness and his enemy and human sinfulness. But it's not actually quite on those combative terms that Paul employs this soldier comparison, is it? You'll see that in verse 4. What he actually says is, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of civilian life. He seeks to please the recruiter. So it's it's not battle suffering that Paul has in view here, you know, that comes from conflict and combat so much, but more the dedication and the self-denial, and the single-minded devotion that comes with being a committed and faithful soldier. And to kind of expand this picture out more, he adds in verses 5 and 6 two other uh, similar illustrations. He says, also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer ought to be the first to get a share of the crops. The athletes competing in the games then as now, well, it required according, competing according to the rules. This required discipline in training, to know the rules, to prepare in light of them, to compete according to the rules. Don't just do your own thing. All this comes at the cost of an athlete. And if you've, you know, we had the Olympics last year and you hear the personal stories of these athletes, hours, hours spent honing techniques and or or getting the right body weight if that's a part of your admission into that event all the things that are sacrificed time with family time with friends sleep all those sorts of things and the same goes for the farmer farming is hard work I have never done it myself as a city boy my whole life but in my former ministry life with Quizworks, I traveled around to lots of rural areas and stayed often for a week or two weeks at a time on farms and I got a glimpse of it Just a glimpse, enough to know that farming is hard work. Early starts, late finishes, back-breaking labour, always having to think ahead, being mindful of the weather, trying to do whatever you can, knowing there are all these sorts of things out of your control. And if you slack off on any of those fronts, you don't reap the rewards. Literally, you don't reap the rewards in many cases as a farmer. So, you know, faithful farming in whatever age of human civilization, it's always been a picture of hard work and commitment. That's what Paul's capturing here, and it comes at a cost. There is a measure of suffering built in to its discipline. So three illustrations of the suffering that Paul's talking about here. A dedicated soldier, a disciplined athlete, and a hardworking farmer. Each involves single-minded commitment and sacrifice and this too Paul says is the challenge of ministry single-minded devotion and sacrifice what does that look like for us to share in suffering as we take on the challenge of ministry here in Minchinbury and Western Sydney well it means it does mean making a priority of ministry I mean taking seriously the fact that your whole life is an act of ministry so wherever you are thinking how can I be a minister of the gospel in some way, but, you know, formally as well. It might mean saying yes to something that has a need, that you perhaps don't feel like it's in your wheelhouse. might be something you haven't done 
It might be like Melanie taking up the position of chaplain. And often saying yes to those things means maybe having to say no to some other me time, valid as those things might be in and of themselves. Now, I can't tell you what those things are on a case-by-case basis. Only you can do that. But it means making a priority of ministry. And it also means that there is weight in ministry. There's this heaviness, a substance to it. You know, and so there are ministries that might mean shouldering emotional and pastoral burdens of others. It might mean <laughs> having to spend time with people you find really difficult to spend time with. That comes at a cost of your ease. It means staying committed in the tough times. All formal ministry has tough times. Not just tapping out when it gets a bit hard for you. Now, of course, people can get overwhelmed. Of course, burnout's a real thing. I'm not saying otherwise. But recognising the challenge of ministry means that sort of commitment. That is what the picture that Paul is painting. That is the challenge of ministry. Suffering as a soldier. But then Paul goes on in verse 8. And he says, Keep your attention on Jesus Christ as risen from the dead and descended from David. This is according to my gospel. So after reminding Timothy of the challenge of ministry, Paul reminds him of the focus of ministry, Jesus. Now the word translated keep attention on is literally just remember, remember Jesus. And we go, of course we remember Jesus. Of course he's the focus of ministry. We get that. But The fact is we are good at forgetting things. Some of us may have better memories than others, but we are good at forgetting things, especially when other influences come in and and take our attention away from what matters. And Paul says to Timothy and therefore says to us, we need to remember Jesus. But not just remember anything about Jesus. Specifically what? Jesus risen from the dead and descended from David. That is, remember who he is And remember what he's done, who he is. Jesus descended from David. God promised to send a king who would make things right between people and God once for all. He's done that in Jesus. Remember what he's done, risen from the dead. The resurrection, it changes everything. Jesus is alive today as I speak right now. And it confirms God's promise to pay for sin and deal with its consequences of death. It means that we can know that that death is not the end. It can be defeated. It has been defeated. This is my gospel, Paul says. Remember this. This is my gospel. That is the one that I received and that I taught, not the one that I conceived and thought up. This is the one that I received from Jesus himself, from the other apostles, and taught. And it brings with it suffering. And here he talks about suffering again, doesn't he? And it is more than the self-disciplined suffering that he described just earlier. Here he describes himself suffering like a criminal. That is, he's in chains, unjustly. Why? Because the message of the God who comes to die and rise again and to deny ourselves and to give our allegiance to him, that was offensive and nonsensical and just disruptive to the world at the time and to the rulers and the authorities of that world. And it remains so in our world. In Paul's case, it led to his indefinite imprisonment. And yet, what does he go to say? He says, because it's the power of God to save people, he knows that the gospel itself, the message, that can't be bound like he is. It will go out and God will reach the people he needs to reach. If you were here at launch last night, Mike, took our attentions to Philippians chapter 1. Paul's in prison. What does he say? This has actually served to advance the gospel. Everyone in the palace guards knows that I'm here because of Jesus. The gospel is not bound. And here we are, 2,000 years later on the other side of the world. The gospel is not bound. And yet it can be sidelined. It can be sidelined by his people in the activity of ministry. We can forget it. Or we can, like Paul's faithless companions in Asia, Phygelus and Homogenes, whom he mentions in the chapter before, we can actually abandon it because it becomes unpalatable to us and our deepest desires or unpalatable to those whose approval and favour we prefer to keep. 
And this can happen bit by bit as we abandon what matters most, as we lose focus. In the TV show The West Wing, in the third season, the president is running for re-election. Uh, and a member of his own party, a senator, is also running to take the nomination off him. But particularly because he thinks the president has lost focus on the things that matter. And he wants just to draw him back to a point where he addresses these things. He doesn't just pander for the votes. And eventually the president kind of comes to his senses. And they have this conversation at the end of the episode. The senator says to the president, I was telling one of your staffers about a friend who got his pilot's licence. He told me the most remarkable thing. He said a new pilot will fly into cloud cover. There'll be no visibility. And they'll check their gauges. They'll look at the artificial horizon. It'll show them level, but they won't trust it. So they'll make an adjustment and then another and then another. He said the number of new pilots who fly out of cloud completely upside down would knock you out. My office will make arrangements for me to endorse you in the morning. You keep your eyes on the horizon. Mr. President, you keep your eyes on what matters. Ultimately, any ministry where Christ is no longer the focus, well, A, it becomes just exponentially harder, but B, it fails to be a true ministry. It does. And examples abound, sadly, throughout church history and even in our contemporary times. You know, where churches that no longer have the gospel of the risen Jesus descended from David, risen from the dead, no longer have that at the centre. They, they, they just drift and they ultimately die. And the biggest tragedy is that they take believers who have gone with them. This has particularly happened in our, in our Western church. We need to keep our eyes on the horizon and to trust the gospel as we received it, as we read it in the Bible. There's a saying that says the extinction of Christianity is always but one generation away. And you see that in churches. You see one generation of churches where it seems to be solid and then only a generation later that church is no longer a church. That's why Paul urges Timothy to pass on the gospel to faithful people who can pass it on to others. That is why we need to keep the message of the risen Jesus central to our ministry. That's first, foremost, and finally the focus of our ministry, even the ones that aren't strictly word-based. It's why, though, we preach and make it central to our gatherings on Sundays, as a part of kids' church, kids' clubs on a Friday, youth. It's why we have discipleship groups and why we train leaders, passing on to those faithful people who will be able to teach others that we may not lose focus on what matters. But why? What is the point? Why does this commitment to ministry and the challenge it brings and the focus on Jesus and the gospel matter. Why? Because it brings salvation. Verse 10. This is why I endure all things for the elect, so that they may also obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Paul endured all that he endured, beatings and stonings and shipwrecks and false imprisonments, of which this was the latest and, as we probably understand, the final one, for the sake of the elect. That is, those whom God has called to salvation, those who hear the gospel message and respond to it. And this salvation is what? It's in, it's in Christ Jesus. It's through his death and resurrection that it's made possible at all. And what's the result? It's with eternal glory. Eternal glory. That is the goal of ministry, hard as it may be. That is the hope of ministry, playing our part in people experiencing salvation from sin and death and entering into eternal glory with God. That's the hope of ministry. Jesus has secured this. And so Paul says it's worth enduring all things for that hope. You know, it's a bit like the, the parent who themselves comes from humble, poor beginnings, who never had any opportunities growing up, who, you know, works themselves to death, multiple jobs, long hours. Why? They endure all these things to provide a better life for their kids. Maybe a better home. 
maybe a better schooling experience. That is the goal. That is the hope. And it's worth it in their view. Paul says the same here about the gospel, about enduring the challenge of ministry and keeping our focus. It's worth it. And this is all driven home in the trustworthy saying in verse 11 to 13. For if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. That is, what is true of Jesus is true of those who trust him. What is true of Jesus is true of those who trust him. He died. If we trust him, we died with him. He lives. If we trust him, we live with him now and forever. If we endure, we reign in the way that Jesus reigns permanently now. There are some sober truths in here. If we deny him, he will deny us. Paul seems to be referencing Jesus' own words from his ministry, recorded in Mark 8.38, where he says, those who deny the Son of Man will be denied by him when he comes in glory. That is, those who, when all is said and done, want nothing to do with Jesus, those people, they will tragically have nothing to do with Jesus, an eternally tragic result. But even if we are faithless, you know, like the disciple Peter was faithless famously, infamously, and we will be faithless every time we depart from living for Jesus, every time we we sin, we're faithless. And ministry is a challenge. Even if we are faithless, he remains faithful. This is the certainty of salvation and the certainty of God's work in our lives what God has done and what God is doing now and to the end. And so we see that in the end, faithful ministry, it is difficult. It is a challenge. But Jesus' faithfulness makes it doable. Faithful ministry is difficult, but Jesus' faithfulness makes it doable. And that may sound underwhelming to you. It's just doable? But I think, you know, Matt has it with the youth that, you know, kind of we're not aiming for perfection with the youth leaders in youth ministry. We're not aiming for perfection. We're aiming just to be able to do it faithfully. Faithful ministry is difficult. But Jesus' faithfulness makes it doable. And so as you take on that challenge of ministry this year, in whatever form that may take, do so please in Jesus' strength. Focusing on him, knowing that he is faithful. And with that vision of being part of God's work of salvation in people's lives, that they may move from death to life and experience the hope of eternal glory. Faithful ministry is difficult, but Jesus' faithfulness makes it doable. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you... uh, Give us the privilege of not only knowing you, but taking part in your work of bringing people to salvation, bringing them to repentance and eternal glory. Help us to go in with our eyes wide open to the challenge of ministry. Um, Give us resources to keep our focus on you and uh, help keep our eyes fixed on the hope of ministry, Um, that it's worth it. And I pray that for everyone here, that you would um, equip us in whatever way we need uh, to do that faithfully. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.